for years, if you ask me what game I most wanted to get a sequel, well, I might have said some random game no one cares about, or a game whose chance of getting a sequel may as well be negative, but if you ask me for a game where a sequel was even feasible in the first place, my answer would be Dragon's Dogma. And now, it's finally happening. I'm very excited to say Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be a thing, and I'm not the only one. Dragon's Dogma has existed for years as a game a lot of people liked, but also a game with many flaws, which a sequel could smooth out and make a real 10 out of 10. So let's talk about Dragon's Dogma, what its faults are, and why it's absolutely loved despite them. The game actually had a long development history, or at least its base concept was around for a while. The game's director, Hideaki Itsuno, came up with the base concept for the game around the year 2000. He wanted something that would take RPGs and add in more action game elements, really get the combat in a nice spot. Years later, Capcom would ask for a game idea that would sell a million copies, and Sinu gave a pitch that would lead to development starting in 2008, with it finally releasing in 2012. An expansion to the game, Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen, would release a year later, and it was important in fixing some issues the base game had. More on that later, though. In the end, Dragon's Dogma had a lot of cut content. There were plans for multiple races, a much larger map, really giant monsters to fight, but the game got scaled down to what we have now. It shows in one or two places, but what we got is still pretty good. The game begins with a little tutorial of you playing as some warrior guy fighting a dragon. It's probably not important. But after that we get the character creation screen and the real inciting incident. A big dragon spawns out of a portal and decides your small fishing village is in need of a destroying. You try to fight it, lose as expected, but then instead of killing you, it decides to eat your heart, leaving you alive. You've become an arisen bound to the dragon and tasked by it to kill it if you want your life back. This is just something that happens every now and then with dragons. Your local duke was one previously. Why a dragon would actually pick someone to kill it, well that's something you'll need to find out. But at any rate, you need to kill the dragon before it destroys more towns, and you have a race of mindless slave people to help you, literally called pawns. The plot of Dragon's Dogma is just decent overall. There are a lot of cool moments when it comes to its unique lore, and its ending is sure to catch you a bit off guard. A lot of what you'll be doing though doesn't relate to the Dragon Quest line. The main quest actually isn't that much of the game, and while the side quests do have some fun characters and moments, they're kind of just filler. An evil cult here, a witch's spooky forest there, not bad at all, just not too memorable in my opinion. A few highlights, but mostly generic, also goes for the characters. None of them were bad, but it's mostly typical for the genre and setting. Say for a handful of them they get to do more, as they're more tied to the actual main plot. You yourself are a silent blank slate, and your traveling companions are also non-characters, so don't expect any thrilling dialogue from them. If you want a general feel for the tone of some of the characters, think of the hit manga series Berserk. And no, that's not a pull for some other kind of similar thing. There is an official crossover where you can get armor from the series, and the design team were reportedly inspired by it. Dragon's Dogma draws you into a big-ish fantasy world for you to explore and fight in. You'll find yourself riding around, jumping, gathering, only to come across a group of goblins or a big cyclops that wants to fight. It really feels like an RPG made by action game developers, just like it's in a wanted. You'll be joined by your personal customizable pawn companion, as well as two others, and together you'll tackle various challenges, both large and small. The gameplay is the real highlight here, though still with some rough spots but I think the overall presentation is also one of the strong points. In terms of its world and character models, the game is very confident for its time. Some of the people can look a little odd, but the environments and monster designs are good stuff, especially the larger ones that get more detail put into them. It's worth noting though that this is a low fantasy setting. There will be harpies and packs of wolves attacking you, but you won't be journeying to the lava zone or anything too fantastical here. All the forests, caves, and mountainsides do look nice though, and I want to give credit to the game's lighting. During the day, the sun's rays and the shadows of the environments can really work, and then, as you enter a dark cave or nighttime approaches, it actually goes dark, requiring a light source to see your own hands. The way the game plays with dark and light and shadow is really fun, and I wish more games would do something like this instead of nighttime being a dark blue filter. Weapon and armor models also show up on characters, and you even have different slots for chest armor and underlying clothing. Given the malleable nature of character models, this is very much appreciated. Soundwise, it likes to stay mostly quiet as you travel across the land, but plays a nice town theme when you're in one, or breaks out the battle themes when you run into monsters. The game has good music, and I love how it hypes you up with a choir when you do something like get a good hit on a large monster.
Unfortunately, the most iconic track is no longer in the game. On release, the title theme was Into Free Dongon by... Bees, I think is how it's pronounced? And it got taken out for copyright reasons. It didn't fit the game at all, and that's what made it so great. The lyrics of The Wind Is Pushing Me is forever associated with this game, unironically a great loss. There is a frequent complaint made with the game's sound though, and that's that your pawn companions like to chime in with voice lines, giving advice or just observations. These can be frequent and very grating to some. Honestly, I've played the game enough that I completely tune them out, but it's a known issue. At least you can say you're as to talk as little as possible. But now let's get into the real meat here. Dragon's Dog was gameplay. Where to start? Well, as mentioned, this is an action RPG where the action was a large focus of the design. You can move around, jump, and attack freely. Player skill and reading enemy attacks can be a large factor in succeeding in combat. Basic combat will feature a lot of light and heavy attacking, while throwing out a skill or two to decimate your enemies. This will work fine against basic goblins, but eventually you'll encounter something a bit larger. Dragon's Dog was large monster combat as one of its hallmarks, and could be very exciting. While many other games would have you sweet as Cyclops' legs or something, here you can freely climb the thing. Attack its face directly for massive damage with your sword, or maybe you have a handy bow and you can just aim at it from a distance. A fireball is an acceptable alternative. Climbing onto a large monster is pretty fun, especially when it goes airborne. Your methods of combat is up to you. Dragon's Dogma has 9 vocations, what would be a class or job in another game, which vary in skills and playstyle. Some are melee focused, some stay in the back and attack from a range, and some are a mix. There's essentially 3 basic vocations, 3 advanced forms of those 3, and 3 hybrids. But don't let the designation of advanced make you think any of these vocations are pointless, as they all have their worth. You unlock access to all of them very early on, but your pawn can't be any of the hybrid classes. Even then, proper party balls can make or break a fight, so let's go over them all briefly. To start, you have Fighter, your basic sword and shield type. You can go in swinging with your sword and block with your shield. Along with the ability to grab enemy attention away from your backline, the basic Fighter is actually the best tank class available, while also being able to dish out some good damage. The advanced version of Fighter is Warrior, who throws out the shield for a mighty two-handed sword or a big hammer. This is a vocation of big swings and big damage, very fun to use, and the primary class we're pretending this is an actual Berserk video game and you're playing as Guts. Next we have Strider, the basic class which would otherwise be called a Rogue. It wields twin daggers and a short bow, allowing it to adapt to many situations. A good all-rounder which can be broken with the right setup, also fun for jumping around and platforming. Its advanced form is the Ranger, which keeps the same basic setup with the daggers, but exchanges the short bow for a long one. The Ranger likes to fire 10 arrows at once with deadly accuracy, and it can really bring the pain with poison or bomb arrows. The hybrid class between Warrior and Strider is Assassin. This is a weird class that can wield a sword, shield, daggers, or a bow. Assassin puts it all into physical damage, it even gets access to bosses during nighttime and when adventuring without companions. It had a very high damage potential, and they really had to nerf it when the expansion came out. Jumping ahead to the other hybrid classes, we have Mystic Knight and Magic Archer. Mystic Knight is melee focused, but with a bigger shield than Fighter, it can use the staff if needed. It likes to fight up close, but can also cast spells to damage enemies, or enchant its shield with magic that retaliates when it blocks. A bit of an odd one, but can fit into any party comp and be devastating. Magic Archer is like an archer that shoots... magic. While your daggers may get the ability to shoot fire, your arrows will home in on targets and deal elemental damage. It's what it says on the tin, it can be very versatile and very deadly. But now we get to the basic mage and the advanced sorcerer. I say these two for last, as they're a decent talking point for the game. As the mage will stay in the back of the group and call fire and lightning on your enemies, you'll have access to simple medium level spells, where the sorcerer gets those, plus the really big ones. This is the most direct upgrade the classes have to each other, but the mage has one important bonus. The sorcerer does a good access to healing magic, making a mage stay vital in party composition. Where a sorcerer is focused on dealing the most damage, mages are better in a support role. So yeah, that covers the vocations and their functions, but it's also worth knowing it can be very valuable to try them all for a bit. With each vocation, you unlock three types of skills. Active ones like swinging very hard with your greatsword to launch you a fireball, Core skills which act as passive boost to your basic attacks during to traversal options, and then we have augments, which carry over between vocations. 
There are also some active skills they share. The same basic lightning spell, for example, only needs to be unlocked once for three different vocations to use it, but augments are equipable passes that are vocation independent and could do things like boost your stamina or defense. So while you may not like Strider as much, it's worth trying it out and leveling up to unlock its stamina augments. Every vocation in this game is worth it. People will discuss what the best ones are, but in reality, they're all balanced and viable. It's just a question of what's the most overpowered. So on the surface, Dragon Saga provides a very fun action RPG system with varying playstyles that encourage experimentation. And the monsters are so fun to fight. Climbing the Cyclops and tricking it to knocking its helmet off, or cutting off the snake tail of a chimera so it has one less attacking part. Some monsters are unharmed by magic or severely hampered when hit by fire. This is the high ethic game that carries it despite everything else. But what do I mean by everything else? Dragon's Dark was one of those games that has a bunch of extra mechanics and systems that it doesn't really need or that you may not even realize. And it starts at character creation. You may begin the game and think, oh, I'm going to make a messed up looking character and it'll be funny, but it's not cosmetic. For some reason, things like character weight affects stamina regeneration speed and carrying capacity, while height affects walking speed, weapon reach, and the ability to go into small holes. Making a fat dwarf has a tangible effect on your character. This is cool in a sense, but also not conveyed the best. It can feel constricting to just making the character you want regardless of stats. In a similar vein, you don't just level up a normal way in this game. When you gain a level, you get stat points based on your current vocation. So if you're a mage, you'll gain stats more in line with that compared to a warrior. This also might scare you away from trying all the vocations and experimenting if you're trying to min-max. The good news is that these stats don't really matter that much. They help, and there are people who min-max strike at Stagma, but I promise these stats are secondary to proper gear, skills, party composition, and strategy. Don't be afraid of messing up your character. It's not worth worrying over. Moving on from character creation, there's still much more to talk about. As you journey around, you'll find a lot of items and materials. These can be used for crafting better items and upgrading weapons and armor. One of my favorite things about this game is its upgrade system. Equipment basically goes up three levels of upgrades, and if you have the materials needed for the final tier, you can just skip the lower ones. Don't you hate it when you have all the endgame materials but you need to go back and farm random early game stuff? Dragon's Dogma lets you skip that, and it's the best. Another thing similar to other games with a cool twist, quests. Now there's essentially three kinds of quests. Mainline story quests, generic kill 10 wolf quests, and side quests. They're mostly as you expect, go to the place and do a thing, explore a cave, kill a monster, but some of them have variations in outcome and solutions which can be cool. There's a store that makes forgeries for key items, and it has tangible effects on some quests. But the quests go hand in hand with the pawn system. I haven't talked much about it, but besides your player character, you have your pawn. You level them up and get them gear just like normal, but your pawn is also summonable by other players, if you're online. When your pawn is summoned, they'll learn from the things they do in other players' games, and come back to you with knowledge on quest solutions or monster weaknesses. Maybe you're doing a quest to find something, and a pawn you summon to your game that's done this quest can point to its location on the world map. The pawn system gives Dragon's Dogma a unique multiplayer angle. You can even summon your friend's pawn for free, regardless of if they're past your level range. There's many more complexities such as personality types or learned behavior where it will mimic your tactics, but the average player probably doesn't need to think about that. The point is, the pawn system is really cool and it works well. But I've been too positive. Let's talk about the other aspect of quests. Dragon's Dogma has missable side quests, which also lead into other side quests. And these start right away, before you would ever think to go back to your fishing village because you might miss something. You need to do this constantly after every story quest unless you follow a guide. Now does it ruin the experience if you miss some side quests? No, but it's not great design. Also, quest boards are unique, so you need to visit each one. You can miss some significant storylines by complete accident. But maybe this isn't so bad because you can fast travel, right? Fast travel is special in Dragon's Dogma. In the base game, you would collect these single-use fairy stones to warp to a port crystal, of which there were two in the base game. One in the main city, and a portable one a bit of a waste through the game that you could pick up and place as you want. This was the worst part of the original game by a large margin, and meant a lot of extra walking around. 
And unfortunately, a lot of that walking is through big expanses of... kind of nothing. Mostly just a large forest with some big creatures to fight, but there's only two real towns in the game. This is a symptom of the cut content. The good news is that the Dark Arisen expansion added four more portable crystals, another fixed one, it gives you an unlimited use fairy stone in your storage box. Make sure to take that. Fast travel can still be a little restrictive, but with proper placement of poor crystals and the unlimited fairy stone, it's a lot better now. So now you can do this side quest without as much hassle, and engage with Dragon's Dogma's extended affinity system. This game has romance mechanics, and you can make, I think literally, any NPC fall in love with you if you do their quest or get them stuff. This comes up once in the entire game, it can have some very funny results, but it's mostly just a weird pointless inclusion in the game. The other big thing Dark Arisen did was add the Bitter Black Isle, an optional roguelite area filled with really tough enemies and clean literal death. It also gets the best gear, new enemies, which the base game could really have used more of, a new boss fight, and some lore if that's more your thing. It helped to give more of an endgame, although the base game had a pretty interesting one. In the end, what can I say about Dragon's Dogma that hasn't also been said by others? The story is decent to good at best, the graphics and overall presentation are similar with some cool aspects to them, there's some weird design choices that even when fixed, noticeably hamper the gameplay, but the gameplay is fantastic enough that no one cares about any of that. The combat is fun and varied with different playstyles, the large monsters are fun and provide a gameplay experience other games don't, the pawn system is needlessly complex in some aspects, but it really works and it's fun to put together your dream team. Dragon's Dogma's gameplay was fun enough to have an MMO released in 2015, Dragon's Dogma Online. It was limited to Japan, but it lasted 4 years and was apparently really fun. It's easy to see why everyone, including myself, are really excited for the upcoming sequel. So if you want to experience a true flawed masterpiece that shows how fun gameplay can carry an otherwise mediocre game, go play Dragon's Dogma. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. If you liked it for some weird reason, consider leaving a like or comment. If you didn't like it, well, I'll leave a comment anyways about what I did wrong. If you want to hear about more games I think are neat, or whatever random thing I end up making videos on, maybe also think about subscribing. Whatever you choose to do, I hope you have a nice day.